back trolling solo my name is adam smith and as you can see on the table today inside of this game overview and gameplay video i'm going to be showing you assault on doom rock this is a prototype for the ultimate edition which comes from bd games it's worth mentioning there is a future crowdfunding campaign coming for this ultimate edition i will have time frames in the pinned comment and video description as we move closer to its launch now the aim of this video is to give you an idea as to how this game plays and flows. I will go over at a high level what this game is all about, how the game is structured. We're going to walk through each of the two major pieces of a single act to give you an idea as to what this game has for you. The Ultimate Edition of Assault on Doomrock is a complete and updated version of the cooperative fantasy board game that's currently in existence, where you can die from an arrow to the knee, poor decisions, and dry jokes. A three-act fantasy adventure campaign is going to feature exploration and combat. It's going to have a version 4.0 rulebook update, numerous enhancements and improvements, integrated expansions, and twice the amount of content that was released for the original game. Now, now, there's a number of main features that are worth highlighting around Assault on Doomrock. There's a big time focus on replayability, scenarios in the spirit of roguelike games generated from a massive amount of cards. There's also a distinct gridless battle system which utilizes dice allocation mechanics and encounters powered by a highly thematic AI. And powering up between encounters, you can do this by exploring a randomly generated world, resolving quests, triggering events, and scoring epic gear and new abilities that bring unexpected synergies between the heroes you're controlling. Now, a game of Doomrock consists of an adventure and a battle, forming an act of a game, and a complete campaign of Doomrock consists of three acts. After each act, the game can be saved, put back in the box for later continuation, or resumed immediately with the next act setup. So that's one of its major pluses, is that you can move through this three-act game but also have a chance to put it away if you're not able to complete the entire thing in one sitting. Now let's touch on victory and defeat conditions. The campaign ends in victory after winning the final battle at the end of Act 3. The campaign ends in defeat if one of these conditions is met. I'll go over these three right now. The first one is, during the adventure, if all heroes are brought to 0 HP at the same time, that's a defeat. If during battle, if all the heroes have actually been defeated, well, that is also a campaign defeat. And finally, during Adventure of Act 3, if the party marker is not on the Doom Rock area after the final time marker is used, that is another defeat. Now, you're not going to see the Doom Rock area laid out here because in this video, I'm focusing on act number one. So we've set up for the very first act as you run through this. And each act, as I already mentioned, is part of an adventure as well as a battle. On the third time through, when you're at this setup here in act number three, you will have a Doom's Rock area that's going to show up in amongst these other areas at random that are going to show up in the setup. And that's what that final defeat condition was around the campaign. If your marker, your party marker, which is this thing right here, is not on the Doom's Rock location when the last time is used, that's a defeat. So that's something you want to watch out for. Now we're going to go around the game board here as I've already set up for Act 1 in our adventure. And I want to talk at a high level as to what you're seeing on the game table to give an idea as to what's going on here before we actually start playing. Now what you're seeing focused on right now is the Hired Goon specifically for solo play. This is a semi-autonomous second hero that has shared dice pool with the hero I'm controlling which you'll see shortly and this is a recommended way to play solo from the designer itself. Now in the setup you're going to go ahead and grab the goon or you can draw one randomly. There will be different goons available. You're going to grab the unique marker which is the marker on the far right hand side that token, the special maneuver card to the left of it, and a deck of activation cards all shuffled up and face down beside it. I've also got six health for this thug down below. Now in terms of the main character that I'm controlling, I chose the Viking. There are 15 plus characters to choose from, from varying levels of experience. You can go for beginner friendly characters, advanced characters, characters that are even considered beyond that, and
then you have some that use pets as well. So there's a lot of variation there once you get comfortable with the game. Now, once you pick the hero you want to use, and I've got the Viking, as I mentioned, on the left-hand side, you are going to go ahead and pick at random a trait card. I've already flipped it over front-facing, and I've got Unhonorable. We'll talk more about that as we go through the game. It'll likely be much more of an impact around the battle and combat side of things, so we won't really need to focus on it here during the adventure as much. And then to the right of it, we have Maneuver, very similar to our uh, AI character that's coming along for the ride with us. And then we have two cards beside that. Those are our starting ability cards. So I have Shield Throw and Lasers. It's worth mentioning that the hero card that you use is double-sided, so you have a choice on either side of the card. And also, I have my marker, which is symbolized on the character's card as well. For those that are interested, this is a number of the beginner-friendly characters that you can choose from, and the alternative side of each of those cards. Here's a look at the advanced characters that you can control. There's also a couple of them in here that can use the pet expansions. As I mentioned, the uh, Beastmaster is an example of that. Not every single one of them is included here inside this prototype, but they all are in the final version. Now for the adventure inside of act number one, I've already gone ahead and randomly set up the adventure map. And that's what's going on right in the middle here across these three major cards here. We have different types set up. So the first one is a town in the yellow banner. Green is wilderness. And on the far right hand side in red, we have the mountains. And to the right of that, we have what's called the area deck. And this is comprised of, as you can see just down below it, randomly from a number of different types of terrain, the ones I just went over. So all these are set up in a way that you won't know what's coming down the line for you. The only thing you do know is that your adventure map's gonna have a town area card, then a wilderness, and then a mountain in terms of its start. But going forward, as you traverse through, if you want to go ahead and to find out what else is laying out there on your adventure, you're going to have to go to the area deck in order to figure that out. There's lots of variation inside of the game, so you're not always going to be seeing the same locations all the time. Now, way up there in the top right, we have a peril die, which is the largest die that you can see there. And we will talk more about that and when it is used. But essentially, if we do want to go exploring off into the wilderness and or whatever lies in wait for us down the road, that peril die will be being rolled. We also have a whole bunch of smaller dice of varying colors. And we'll talk about this as it will come into play during combat in the second half of act number one. But the one thing I needed to do do as part of setup in the adventure section of the game is to go ahead and get an encounter card. We're going to randomly draw them, which I've already done, which is called a battle randomization card for the act that we're in. So you can see the Roman numeral one on there. So that's all situated. To the left of the battle card, we have a large deck with dice on the very top of it. That is the level up abilities cards. And then to the left of that, on the bottom, we have the common items above it, the epic items, and then to the left Left of it, we have the events, the secret areas deck, and beside that, the two value worth of money we have to start off the game. And then to the left of that, we have a setting card. This is also chosen at random, and it's going to tell you how much time you have during the adventure portion of your act in order to move through these different locations that are face up in front of us, or even potentially, as I mentioned, traverse elsewhere. Now, the card that I got has a seven time in the top left hand corner. So I place seven tokens and those tokens will go away as we choose to do different things as part of the adventure portion of this act. It's called Mountain Treasure, this setting card, and it states in it, in the tavern, some mighty drunk patron told you about masses of treasure left in the mountains. Apparently the treasure was abandoned there by dragons and dragon moss. Surely he knew what he was talking about. It states we get to add one to all loot rolls in the mountains. That's definitely something to keep in mind. You'll see on the right hand side of that card, it also gives us a loot chart to roll on and rewards down below for the future. I've also gone ahead and grabbed a number of tokens from the game, placed them into game trays. The game trays are of my own usage and not part of the prototype in any way, shape or form, but they are very handy in terms of organizing things out. You're not going to need all these tokens all the time, but some of them are going to be called upon quite frequently as you will see. So with that all said, we are now ready to find 
find out a little bit more about where our party is currently residing and what options we have for us. So as you can see here, we're in a wilderness town, a tavern, and it states this tavern is oddly reminiscent of your early adventures. But then again, you were terribly drunk and it might have been some other tavern. Yes, it's quite possible. Now in the top left hand corner of every single one of these area cards, whenever they come out and are revealed, you're going to get what's called a secret token and you're going to place those that many secret tokens based on the value that's in that top left hand corner and what that is is your way of exploring through that location and there are positives to doing this in terms of potentially getting a benefit sometimes when you explore through an entire secret pile of tokens that in the red banner there will be something that you'll gain out of it and other times you'll need to do it in order to potentially mitigate a negative that could be coming off the card or other cards. So as a great example, on the far right hand side here where the haunted ruins lie, you'll see right underneath this gigantic secret token stack has a lot more going for it. Once we actually traverse through all those secret tokens, right there in the red banner, it states two times common items. So if we we're able to fully explore the haunted ruins and dare to go in there and do so, and again, we're going to have to manage our time and able to make sure we can do this, we have the potential to get two common items that could be very handy. The middle location here is called the Riverside, and it has two secret tokens on it. It has much less than what's going on at the Haunted Ruins in terms of those secret tokens, but one more than at the tavern where we're, we currently actually reside as a party. Now, we're going to go back to the tavern and talk about all the different options, but as you can see as I've gone over these close up, there's a whole bunch of options and things to choose from on each of these different areas. So we're at the tavern. We have multiple options here to choose from. We have brawl, bar deals, room, under the table, and loot gossip. So let's go over them quickly. Basically, if there is a kind of effect that happens immediately on having your party marker in an area, then it will be in a giant white banner along the bottom, which doesn't, there's nothing here on the tavern for that, but the Riverside location and the Haunted Ruins have something mentioned there that is worth keying in on later on. I'll touch on them. So. Here here we have Brawl, for instance, right beside it, you'll see an exclamation mark. That relates to the secret token that's up top here. So essentially, if you want to do something, you have to look to make sure you can pay the icons that are beside it. It might be time, it might be a secret marker, and it might be free. It might not cost anything. So I could just choose to go straight to bar deals here, and I could go ahead and start spending coin in order to potentially gain a shield token, which could be beneficial. I could remove a uh, provoke token if I happen to have gained one, or I can try and actually pay my way to gaining uh, heroism as well as exposing myself. Maybe I'm talking and kind of boasting uh, about myself at the bar. So it's very thematic in terms of the uh, what you're gaining in terms of these tokens, and they have ripple effects in combat as well that you'll see later on. Now the brawl one's pretty funny because if I went ahead and did the brawl, I'm actually going to gain some uh, heroism, but then I'm going to gain a provoke token and then two exposure right so that's where you might go have a brawl beat up a bunch of people head to the bar here and pay your way out of some of the things or some of the negatives that you might have gained now moving along the bottom of this card here we have a room so for one gold we can essentially you know camp in a space in a room in this tavern and it's going to give us five hp back right now we're under max so that's not something we want to do we also can remove a whole bunch of exposure by doing this so resting is always good that way uh, we can also go for under the table which is simply just time passing so we're you know essentially passing out under the table maybe after we've had way too much to drink we're only going to gain so much health back not as much as sleeping in a bed like the room but we do get something and then our exposure goes down a little bit but not as good again as having an actual private room so again very thematic that way and then the loot gossip in the top right hand corner would use a secret token and allows us to scout which is a really cool action scouting is really 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 cool because it allows you to take a look at the top of one of the decks from a number of them that present themselves inside this adventure section of the game so it could come from the level up ability deck the common items the epic items the events secret areas the area deck the battle randomization card itself like you pick anything essentially that's face down in this adventure area here in order to reveal it to look at it and give you maybe a leg up 
Once you've taken a look at it, you can choose to discard the card by placing it at the bottom of the deck if you don't like it, or keep the card revealed, and then it's called a scouted card at that point, which may be referred to by other effects in the game later on. However, as you can see here on the tavern card, sometimes the scout, well in this case allows us to do it twice, but it restricts us in terms of which decks we can actually check out. It can only be the common and epic decks, and it mentions that specifically. Normally, it's much more in terms of the options you can choose from. Now, something else I want to mention is around shops. There might be shops we see as we reveal areas going forward that might come into the woodwork and say something like two common, one epic item. So basically, some items that you can purchase and maybe a cost associated in gold beside them. It's worth mentioning if it does mention a common or epic item, you're supposed to actually go draw cards off the top of the deck and create a shop so you can look to see what wares are there. Now the shop that I have here at the tavern it has nothing to do with actual items. It's more so around tokens. So there's no shop that I need to create here so we can move past that. Now it is worth mentioning that all these major actions that you can do when you're on a specific area, the big ones, the most important ones are color coded and larger than the rest so you can see here like the bar deals has a shop keyword the camp keyword they're all color coded and the larger scout those are the major things that you're doing on each of these but some different areas that you will explore will have small things that you can kind of entertain yourself with that could have some big time benefits and help you out like the brawl thing is a good example when we get to the haunted ruins you'll see all kinds of other examples as well the final thing i want to mention before we begin our adventure in act number one is around camping and as I talked about earlier you can camp in order to gain some health back potentially maybe reduce your exposure overall and sometimes if you're inside the haunted ruins like in a stone bed for instance a camp action may have you actually increase your exposure so there's different things that can happen in a camp action but it's really cool to note that while doing it you have the opportunity to level up and again it's going to be dependent on whether you can afford to do the level up and the cost of it is going to be based on the character you're controlling. So when you're playing solo here, I've got this character, the Viking, in front of me, and it's based on how many abilities you have present in front of you is the cost to level up, including the ability that's on the trait card as well. So in total here, we have four. It would cost four silver. Now, I might have mentioned earlier before, probably multiple times, gold. I'm doing that. I don't know why I'm doing that. It's probably just ingrained in me, but it is silver in terms of currency within this game. Now that we've covered the high level of everything, let's go ahead and do a full adventure section of the game inside of act number one. So we are at the tavern here and what is kind of pulling me is this scout. I do really want to check this out because we have the potential to check out common and epic decks only and remove a card on the top we may not want or we could potentially just have it visible so we know it's there and then really try to go after it. So I've gone ahead and paid the cost and the cost was the exclamation mark for the secret token that was at the top of the tavern it has been removed which means the area has been explored now and now I get to scout twice but I have to keep it to the common and epic decks only. The first one I'm going to choose to check out is the common deck. Let's go ahead and flip that one over. It appears at the tavern we have found some pickles and we can consume this. The heroes in your group may discard a total of four exposure, then deal one exposure to each character in a distant group. I've chosen to go ahead and discard that one to the bottom of the deck. I don't really want to see that one. And instead we're going to go for the next card in the common item deck. The Black Hole Potion. Consume. Target each character in two groups. Move all the targeted characters to an empty group. That one sounds pretty good potentially for combat, so I might leave that one face up. Now it's worth mentioning that if I didn't have the restriction in terms of where I could scout, I certainly would have been eyeing the battle card that I have here. I'd love to know what's coming down the line in that battle. I'd also would have loved to potentially scout this area deck here to see if venturing forth would potentially be a positive for me or maybe bring an area into play that I don't really want to deal with or have in play. There's also the event deck, the secret areas deck. There's other decks here that are probably of higher interest to me than the item decks that I was digging through. But again, in that particular case, I was stuck to just those decks. But hey, the Black Hole Potion does sound useful. 
So that concludes one of the four major adventure actions that you can do when you're in the adventure phase. And the other ones that you can do is you can travel between locations that are revealed currently. So if I wanted to, I could go ahead and spend one time to move to another revealed area of the adventure map. So I can move from the tavern to Riverside, which is actually something I'm probably going to do right now because there's nothing else really going on at the tavern. The party is now in Riverside. I've gone ahead and also spent one one time, so we have six remaining until the end of the adventure portion. At the riverside it says, you've always dreamt of piloting a raft as an optimistic child, and now you have this opportunity as a suicidal adult. Now you've seen two of the four major actions you can do during your adventure. We have traveled between areas and we have also visited a location. The other thing you can do is search a location. So for instance, we are now at Riverside and there are two secret tokens there. We can choose while there to search. What we would do is remove a secret token and we would grab an event card from that deck in the top right hand corner and see what happens. This could throw all kinds of different stuff at you, but it definitely adds to the variation of each of these different areas. The fourth and final major action is to venture forth. And that's why I waited until we were here because we can actually do it from this location if we wanted to. It says go with the flow. It would have us discard one secret marker and then venture forth, which would use a peril die. We'd be removing the tavern forever, sliding the two locations we have, which is Riverside and the Haunted Ruins, down to the left, and then exposing or revealing the next location, which appears to be a wilderness one based on the back of the area card. But first, before all of this, so we have to take note of the god rays down here, which doesn't have an effect right now, but might have. Now, the other thing I want to talk about is in the top right-hand corner, the other side. For one time, we could add a location to this area if there isn't any here that could potentially give us something pretty cool. And I think I'm going to do that. So let's burn a time and we're going to grab a card from that secret area deck up top. And it appears we have found some tunnels. Try and find some stuff. So we have the opportunity here to spend some time to actually do a loot roll, which could be a lot of fun. So we'll definitely go ahead and burn another time in order to search this location based on the cost beside it. It does state that we either get a loot plus one or a loot minus three. So this can be interesting because depending on what you're actually trying to gun for, you might want to be trying to drop your uh, total loot roll down lower, and that might make a lot more sense once particular cards come out that have you potentially finding things that people might be wondering where they are, and they're at a zero level, let's say. It helps you to reduce your overall loot level. So you might think that that's a real bad thing, but it actually can be helpful. Uh, but in my case here, because I'm not really going after anything, and I don't want to land on anything around zero or one as both of them state nothing on the chart i'm going to take that plus one and we're going to go ahead and grab a d6 as it states right here beside it and we're going to roll and see what we can add to that and hopefully it's a good thing we got ourselves a three it rolled just off camera so we got a total of four and it states ha one common item look at that and we know what it's going to be because we revealed it and scouted it earlier it's the black hole potion a decent find in the tunnels we found the black hole potion i've gone ahead and slotted it into one of my hand slots you'll see on the outsides of the trait card there's different slots here so you have a slot for an artifact you have a slot for armor you have a slot for one hand another hand over here so you can carry some stuff now one thing i want to draw your attention to is to the haunted ruins which has all kinds of stuff going on for it. It has a lot of costs in terms of different locations we can interact with at this area, but at the very bottom, that laughter in the dark there, that states at the, at the start of a battle, if this area is not explored, which means if not all the secret tokens have been completely removed, then we get two exposure added to us if we happen to have a particular type of token already on us, and that token is the provoke token. So if we had a done that brawl inside of the tavern, we'd have a provoke token token and that is one of the major reasons when I looked at the haunted ruins I went well if I don't have enough time to get through the whole haunted ruins and because of the fact the haunted ruins on the far right hand side of the adventure map even if I tried to venture forth a bunch of times aggressively to get rid of the haunted ruins out of this area or adventure map area uh, I still would be in trouble so I was like
like if I don't brawl, it'll keep me away from getting that provoke token and I'll do everything I can to do that because I don't have enough time to rip through the haunted ruins. But I'd still like to go visit them because it appears like there's some good loot potentially down there, but there's risk. As you can see, we could potentially get a provoke marker from doing so. So I need to be really careful about how I choose what I do next. Now I've got two secret markers at Riverside and I'm thinking that what I'm gonna do is use a time and I'm going to search at this location. Now when I was talking about searching, I didn't mention the fact that you do have to discard a time in order to search there and pull the event card. You also then remove a secret token as well, as I mentioned. So that will drop us down to three time if we choose to do so. So we'll go ahead and do just that. And we're gonna grab an event card and see what we get. It. The torture chamber is what we found while digging around these tunnels in the riverside. It says there's a lot of machinery in this room. It's tempting to try some of the devices out. Painful entertainment. We can take a heroism token and do a loot roll with a plus two, but we have to take two damage if we choose to do that, or we can just simply loot. And if we just simply loot, we get plus two. I honestly think a simple loot is probably the best thing to do here. I don't really want to take damage that I might not be able to heal in time before before I get into combat. So let's go ahead and roll this up and see how we do. A six, wow, okay, I will take it. And a plus two, so that's an eight. And ladies and gentlemen, that puts us at the top of the loot table. We gain one silver and an epic card. And that's awesome because we're working our way up to the four silver we need in order to go ahead and level up. Let's go ahead and pull a card off the top of the epic deck. We have no idea what this thing is. It could be good, could be bad. I mean, it's epic, it's gotta be something good. We got the Forbidden Tome. What an extremely cool item to find in the tunnels of Riverside. A Forbidden Tome, plus one agility. Use is to gain one heroism token, then deal yourself one exposure and immediately resolve it. Now on the bottom right of this Forbidden Tome, it tells you what you need to have in terms of abilities on your character in order to equip this relic. And the relic is the symbol on the far right hand side telling you what slot this needs to go in. What you're gonna do is take a look at your character and you'll see right underneath of the ability cards where it shows the icons for the dice. There is a short form for intelligence on the lasers and STR for strength on the shield throw, which lets us know we have one of each of those, which meets the requirements in order to equip the Forbidden Tome, which is absolutely perfect. So we now have a Viking that has lasers, a shield throw, a black hole potion, and a Forbidden Tome. This individual sounding cooler every second. I think I know exactly what I want to do next, and that is to venture forth. So we're going to go ahead and spend this secret marker to do it. It's going to also cost us a time in order to venture forth. And we are going to go ahead and remove the tavern out of the equation, shift the riverside and haunted ruins down to the left, and we're going to reveal whatever the top of the area deck has in store for us. The party marker then moves to the newly ventured forward area that has been revealed, which you can see here is the old forest. It says this path will surely lead you to success. There is stumps here, a camp. We can camp at the stumps. We can go into the deep forest, which has the ability to give us some loot, but the downside is you'll see a skeleton uh, or a skull icon there. That is the peril die that we would have to roll if we were doing that. Down the bottom right, we have rubber berries, uh, so we could spend a bunch of secret markers in order to gain some heroism tokens. And if you have none, then you end up doing a peril roll as well. Uh, this location's interesting. It does have three secret markers, which we're gonna place in the top left-hand corner right now, make some decisions on what we want to do next with just two time remaining. Now you'll also see that the area deck to the right, every single time you reveal one, you're gonna know at least what type of terrain is coming your way if you choose to venture forth again. So if we did it again, we know a town is coming up. So if we really were gunning for a town, now that the tavern has been completely removed from our adventure map because of us venturing forth into the old forest, we could try to venture forth again and push that way. But I don't have any reason to heal up at this point. I'm really just trying to collect as much money at this point as I possibly can. That's my 
my major focus right now. Now, because we're in the old forest and it seems like the majority of these different locations we could interact with have a peril die role involved, I should probably go over the different sides of the peril die so you have an idea as to what kind of fun you have coming your way if you roll it. Uh, basically, this die has this symbol on one, actually two sides of the die, and that symbol is going to have each hero being dealt one face down exposure marker if it lands there. The next one is the damage. That's this one here. There are three sides like that. So each hero is dealt a damage if we roll that one. And the other one is a double. This one right here. And that is for each hero being dealt one damage for each pair of their exposure markers. So if you have a whole bunch of exposure markers, you say you have like six, you're taking three damage from something like that. With my two time remaining, I'm gonna to choose to spend a time and I'm gonna get rid of a secret token in order to draw an event. We're gonna see if the event can give us something handy or useful. Let's see what we got. Damsel in distress. You see a gritty fella dragging a lady out of a house. This is an excellent opportunity for saving the damsel, which will have us roll the peril die. We do gain a coin though, and that's huge. That would get me up to four coins, and with one time left, I would be able to camp at the stumps of the old forest and level up, which is probably what I want to do, or I could loot the house. Well, in this case, let's do the top option because I really do want to level up. All right, I've gone ahead and already given myself the coin because, well, the peril die that rolled I'm gonna do right now is not gonna affect that. So I've got four coins, four silver coins, but here comes the peril die. Let's see what it does to me. Ah, oh, it is gonna be a hit on my health. So I'm knocking myself down from six to five. Now I'm gonna go ahead and do my loot roll. I have a plus two. Unfortunately, the add one to loot rolls for being in the mountains, I have not been able to take advantage of that during this act at all. The only time that would have been worthwhile is if I had gone to the haunted ruins and tried to go after the stone chest, but I just didn't make time for it this time around. Let's roll and see if we can find something in the old forest while we're digging around inside of her house. Uh, we got ourselves a five. That's a good roll. So a five plus the two gets us to a seven, which is a plus two silver coin. So now we have six coins. No complaints at all about that. I really didn't expect to get so much money out of an event, but you can see sometimes things can go in your favor. And with my final time, I'm gonna do a camp action. This works out perfect. I just lost a health. The camp action is gonna give me that health back. I can't go above my maximum six, but I'll take the one that I just took as a hit back. So I'm back to full health now. I lose any exposure that I happen to have to this point, but I don't have any, which is a huge positive. Um, it does state I'm burning a time, which I have just just done so I've run out of time but now we can choose to level up I'm gonna pay four silver and we'll start that process the first step of the level up is to go ahead and draw three cards off the top of the level up deck that is the deck with the two dice on top of it so I've got those three cards here in front of you the uppercut heart rip and black venom we have two of which are considered melee cards precision based on their keywords this one is a support card something to keep in mind when you pull these cards is that you're able to discard a number of them in order to redraw up to the amount you discarded back up to three. So if you get a bunch off the hop you just don't like, you can kind of mulligan it in a certain way in order to get some stuff back. So for me personally here, I'm looking for something that's gonna bolster my attack. So it was really good I got the uppercut and the heart rip because those are two that I'm interested in. I don't necessarily wanna go after the black venom one just based on my strategy. So I'm gonna go ahead and discard this one and right now I'm going to draw another card to add into the pool and see if we get something interesting. We got ourselves a shark missile. This is a magic precision. All right. So we got a bunch of options here. Now taking a look at them, something else to keep in mind is, of course, when you take an ability card and add it into your pool, you're also boosting the stats of your character, which then goes back and ties back into what you can equip on your character. So if I chose to take uppercut, I get a strength plus one. I already have a strength plus one for shield throw. So that means I'm now a strength plus two character, which means if I ever get an item that acquires two strength in order to wield it or equip it then I've got that covered. Something else to keep note of is the die on these cards. Now you'll notice they're all in red. Don't worry about the coloring. Focus more so on the actual pip value that matters. When I'm rolling during combat, I'll be slotting dice into these cards. I've got a three, five, six, 
two, and any die can go into the one with the question mark. So maybe going after an ability card that isn't already covered in terms of the exact same die required to be on the card would be the best approach here. Now, another aspect of the decision you need to think about, and you'll see this flushed out when we get to combat, is around what color die do you want to add into your pool? In this case, no matter which one we pick, because these are all based on attacks, as you can see down in the uh, ability section of each of them, it's going to be a red die that you'll be adding into your pool. I've already got one red die from the lasers card I have up here. My shield throw gives me an orange one, my maneuver card gives me a black one, and my trait gives me an orange. So having two reds not actually all that bad, especially when I'm trying to do damage when I'm just leveling up at the very beginning. It's actually not a bad way to go. Now the other thing you're going to want to keep an eye on is synergies between your cards. Like how does your character actually work in terms of putting damage out and becoming more familiar with how your character's beginning loadout actually works is really helpful in making the key decisions on which ability cards you should grab when you're leveling up. Now going into this one, any of these three are going to be helpful and it really just comes down to reading each of them in terms of the benefits they could provide. I'm leaning towards the uppercut because of the ability to deal three damage is so crazy. The heart rip is a little less on damage but really pumps me up if I start using uh, heroism tokens because then I can start ignoring armor and other benefits from that as well. And then the shark missile just came out. It also can do three damage to a character. And then when resolving your exposure, you can ignore things to deal damage, which is nice. And you also have a heroism bonus at the very bottom as well. So there's a lot to think about here. In the end, I've decided to go ahead with the uppercut card and we will talk more about that and its effects and how I can make use of it when we get into combat. And we're getting very close to that now because, well, we have run out of time. Now your adventure doesn't stop the moment that time runs out because there might still be actions you can pull off that don't require time and you can still do those so long as you can pay the cost that they're asking for. So for instance, if I wanted to do the rubber berries here at this area, I do have two secret tokens on this area that I could discard in order to gain a heroism token, which would be a plus to me if I don't have one. I just have to roll the peril die, which I think I'm actually going to go ahead and do. The heroism token is there. I've gained it. I'm now going to roll the peril die. And yes, absolutely. I guarantee you there are people that are watching right now saying, hey, wait a minute. You should have done this rubber berries thing just before you chose to do the uh, camp action. And to be completely honest, that would have made the most sense. So I'm in hindsight going to kind of do things in reverse, pretend like I've rolled this die prior to my camp action, because that would have been the smart thing to do. And if I happen to get the damage, then I'll just heal back up to six and call it a wash. Yes, I'm kind of gaming the game here a little bit because I'm doing things out of order, but I'm doing this for example purposes is not a full play. All right, there it is. And again, the damage on this die was likely to hit as it's about a 50% chance of landing. So essentially, if you remember before I took the camp action, I already had a damage and then I just took this damage and then I'm taking the camp action that restores me back up to full, which is where I'll be now that we are done our adventure. Now it's time to check out our battle randomization card to see who we are facing in the upcoming battle. It appears we have some exploding tomatoes to deal with. Battles are divided into rounds and before each round the heroes are going to roll and place dice in their abilities planning their actions for the round. Now during a round the heroes are going to remove the place dice from their cards allowing them to perform actions such as moving and attacking. Meanwhile the enemies will attempt to take out the heroes by performing their activations based on their battle sheet and activation deck which you'll see a close up of very soon. The fight continues for subsequent rounds until either the heroes defeat all the enemies or any objectives that are designated or until the enemies take out the heroes. As we know exactly who our enemy is, the Exploding Tomatoes, I've got the battle sheet right here. In the top left-hand corner, you'll see what act this enemy is associated to, and you'll also see information like the HP of the enemy, which in this case is four, and how many shields, uh, the tokens that might be on these enemies as they come in at the beginning of the round. In this case, there's going to be one on every single one of them. Now, it's worth mentioning how HP is actually tracked on the battle mat, which you'll see shortly, is you're going to have a token representing a 
a total of two HP. One side will represent that there's two, and if you flip it over to its cracked side of a different color, then it's going to be down to one, and then of course if you remove it fully, then it's down to zero. So in this case, being that there are four HP, there will be two tokens in a stack for every single exploding tomato, plus a shield token on top, and they're going to be displayed very similar to what you're seeing over here. This group, this group, and this group will be set up. These two right here will not, as it's for four and three player games, so those are going to be dismissed. And then we have the terrain modular expansion. If you're using it, then you're going to be adding terrain at two different spots here. Terrain B is right up against in a group with some of the minions, which will be quite interesting. And then down at the very bottom, you'll see where our heroes are coming in. We have special setup instructions for the exploding tomatoes. This states unstable biology. One tomato per player is in an unstable tomato. And during setup, randomly mark these enemies with a boss marker in place of the bottom minion marker. So again, going back to how the HP is set up for each of the six tomatoes are gonna to be on the battle mat, is they're gonna look like this typically two chips high because, as I mentioned before, each side of the chip represents one HP. So as you chip through these chips and beat them up, they're going to slowly flip over, disappear, flip over, disappear. Well, what makes this unstable thing kind of interesting is randomly, we're gonna be using one of the boss markers instead for the bottom chip, and it's gonna be sitting like so on two of the six tomatoes. So I'm not gonna know which ones are unstable until I start going after each of these. And it also mentions here, heroes may not inspect the markers of tomatoes when they're at full HP. So you cannot be peeking or finding any ways to get an advantage as to which ones are unstable. The next thing you need to do for setup is the activation deck. Quite easy, you're gonna take a look here based on the player count. Two is all in white, three in blue, including, and then four player up to the gold or orange color. So in my case, I need three times two, which I've got here. I need an ace, queen, and joker. That is my activation deck. I'm gonna shuffle this together and that will create it. So now that you've seen the battle sheet in terms of the setup and the activation deck, which is all ready to go, let's talk about the modular expansions that I am using as part of this battle. So the first one is, well, it's kind of obvious, I used it in the adventure mode and it still carries on whenever you choose to use one of these module expansions. They're in there for the entirety of your gameplay. I already chose to use the thug as part of my solo experience. So that's one. The second one I'm choosing to use is these custom ability dice, which you will see as we go along are much more interesting than the red dice up there in the top right hand corner, which are the typical ones that you use. Now these ones are going to change up some of the rules that are the basic rules of how the rules resolve in combat, but I think it makes it more exciting and it also is color coded to the different abilities that your not only your thug has here, but also my Viking plus trait cards. So you're going to take a look at a small little square on each of them, and they'll all be different colors, whether it's for attack, support, whatever it is, you're going to get different colors that you then go ahead and roll, and skulls on the dice, as you'll see, can be re-rolled indefinitely once you get past your typical two re-rolls after your initial roll and that means that you can really kind of you know hunt for what you're trying to accomplish in terms of placing dice and ability cards to trigger some really cool effects and you'll see how that all pans out as we go into battle. Now the other thing that you're probably seeing is the terrain. So we do have a trap or a bear trap here and a tree up there. Those were completely random as it's stated here on the setup to put some terrain in play. That's part of another modular expansion. You don't need to use them, but you can add them in. And again, that's gonna add variability to the battles that you're gonna be playing. Now those cards and what they do and how I could use them are very similar to the ability cards my character actually has. You can place dice on these and currently they sit with the tokens with no dice symbols showing in terms of the actual token on the battle mat you saw moments ago. But once I use them and they flip over to the opposite side, then the enemy gets a chance to actually make use of those terrain elements as well. So if you choose to use them, the enemy will likely be coming back and doing something pretty nasty at you. As you can see on both these cards, the top one there, the top banner of the gear is what the heroes will use these terrain cards for. And the bottom there in the skull banner 
here is what the enemies will use these terrain elements for. Now a couple things I want to mention in terms of my thug here and the Viking. If one of them gains a heroism token or uses one of those tokens, then both of those heroes either gain or use the token. So hopefully that makes sense. But essentially when I gained one of these tokens at the very tail end of the adventure phase, I give the token to both heroes. But then as soon as one of them uses it on one of their cards to boost something in a positive way, both of them are going to be spent. Now something I want to change from the level up that I did in the adventure section of the game is I want to actually put the uppercut ability that I gained on my thug instead. And why I'm doing this and why I'm changing my mind on this is because it's much better using this modular expansion with the thug to give it the first ability to the thug, mainly because they currently come out of the gates with just a maneuver, making them quite not so useful uh, out of the gates in a battle. Whereas if I've leveled up already, which I successfully did, I can place an ability card on the thug and the thug can make use of an attack, which would be certainly a good thing. Now it's worth mentioning when using this modular expansion, you're gonna be doing level ups over time. So you're gonna level up beyond just one time. And every time you level up, you're gonna go back and forth between the thug and your other character, your main character, in my case, the Viking, in terms of giving ability cards back and forth. So if I give one to the thug this time, the next time I level up, I'll be giving it to the Viking. So that's now been changed up. And it's worth mentioning, you're never gonna be doing that kind of an adjustment when you're playing the game for real. I'm just using this as an example purpose that when you do your first level up, it's likely much better strategic option to place that first level up ability that you get on your thug. So I'm making sure the thug has the ability to do some damage. Now, what we're doing right now is taking a look across all of the ability cards we have for these small little boxes. And we're grabbing a die from these special dice, these special custom ability dice for each of them. And that includes everything the thug has, including everything the Viking has that also includes Includes the trait card which also has one too and that makes up our pool of dice that are these six. So now that you have a high level understanding of the combat let's dive into a full round of battle going through each of the phases. There's a roll phase, start of round phase, initiative phase, enemy phase, boss phase, hero phase, and end of round phase and then that recycles over and over again until all of the enemies are killed off or all of the heroes are killed off or if there's an objective in play that's been completed. At the beginning of the roll phase, the first thing you're gonna do is pull a goon activation card. This is gonna tell you the time that the thug is going to activate inside of the round. In this case, start of the initiation phase, it will try and do something and end of the hero phase. So once that card has been drawn for your thug, now we're gonna go ahead and collect our pool of dice, rolling the dice, and then placing them on the abilities we wish to trigger during the round. Just before I do my first roll, I wanna point out two things that are a change when using these special custom ability dice. And that's the fact that you'll see the heroism marker or icon right in the middle there, and you'll also see shield icons depicted. Now, normally in the rules, when you're playing it with the red dice, so not these custom dice, but the red ones, if you roll a one, you can gain a shield. And if you get a six, you can gain a heroism token. That gets stripped away when you're using these dice because the icons are literally depicted right on the dice themselves. And if you roll them, then you can go ahead and gain them. Now it is worth mentioning that you get to roll your dice once and then you get two re-rolls of an unlimited amount of dice that you want to roll after that. So you can essentially roll your dice once, start plotting things into the different ability cards based on what you want to try and do, re-roll anything you don't like and continue from there. This variant with these dice also allows that if you get down to the very end and you have any dice that show a skull on it like this, even there's four of them, you're allowed to roll that die indefinitely so long as you're just landing the skull side of the die until you get something else out of it. So it makes it very, very interesting and much different than the typical D6s of just one to six pips. So let's go ahead and roll these off and see what we get here. So off the gates here, we have a skull, which we're gonna have to re-roll later on. Another one, which we'll be re-rolling later on. Three of them, oh my gosh. So we have the potential here to gain ourselves a shield, which is a plus. Having shields is good, especially if we're gonna get hit. We have a four and a five, so can we make use of those? I think what I'm gonna do right off the top here is I'm gonna place the die with a four result in the question mark spot here. You'll see that there is a bolt 
sign beside it, which means it's an initiative round triggered ability. So during the initiative round, if I wish to use the die at that point in time, I can. And that's going to allow us to do something before the enemies get to do something. In this case, it gets to use my cheap shot ability, which is quite awesome as a trait on its own. Plus, it's worth mentioning at the start of a round, if I didn't have this particular die sitting in this card, then I would actually take an exposure token, which as you will see, exposure is something you want to be giving to the enemies and not accumulating too much of it yourself as whenever you're attacked you have to reveal them and that can really start to swing the damage and different conditions that can be coming your way. I'm going to choose to place my five pip die on the lasers that takes up one of the slots there for five which I'll move it on top of in a second. You'll also see a slash and then a six meaning I could have a five and a six on this card to be able to use it twice and you'll know how much you can charge a card up with the number of dice based on the symbols underneath. You'll see those circle symbols just underneath. It'll tell you how many times you can charge up that card. So with that die now in place, I'm pretty happy with the two dice I placed for my very first roll. Let's go ahead with our first re-roll and we'll have one more re-roll after that. And then any skulls we have after that, we'll keep on re-rolling until we get something good. Let's find out how this first reroll goes. We got ourselves a three, two sixes and a shield, not bad. So I've gone ahead and used one of the threes on my maneuver for the Viking. The other three, I'm gonna go ahead and use a full last reroll on and see what we get. Here we go. Got ourselves a six, a six and a four. I placed a six on the lasers, a four on the tree. It's worth noting that it does have a bolt beside it, which means that I can use that during the initiative round. And I'm hoping to do so to use it with the thug if my strategy pans out. I could have also placed it on the trap if I had interest in that as well. But remember, as we use these terrain elements, they'll come back on us when the enemies get a chance to use it in the future. And then this one right here, I'm not gonna use for anything. I have nothing else I can use a six for, but I'm gonna be able to gain a heroism token from it, which is awesome. So we'll have have a total of two. The roll phase is now done. We move to the start of round phase. So we look for any start of round effects and we have one right on our trait card. Every character does. And this one states, if I didn't have a die on the cheap shot, then I would take an exposure token at this time. Now, all the exposure tokens are face down. I don't know what they are, but if I needed to take one, I would have taken one and placed it next to my hero. And as I mentioned before, if we get attacked, we flip it and something typically just adds to the pain for us. The next phase we move to is the initial initiative phase. So heroes can remove dice from initiative enabled abilities. Those are the ones with the lightning bolt and use them to move, attack or heal or whatever they happen to state. Now my thug here has a start of initiative phase ability. It states attack, deal one damage to an enemy with the least HP. And this is a ranged precision attack. And it states here, if we have a heroism token to spend, which I do, I'm going to spend this to bolster the attack, dealing two damage. And then afterwards, Words, we're going to gain a stealth token. So I'm going to have my thug take a shot here for one damage, but we're going to use a heroism token to bump it up to two damage in order to hit this one right here. Now it's worth mentioning that the shield, of course, absorbs one of the HP and then the top chip is flipped over to count as the other HP damage that went through. And of course, I'm discarding a heroism token from both characters in order to pull off that additional boost. Now, as you'll see here on the flip side of the battle sheet for the enemy, once you're done setting up, it's got the health here listed. It also has armor listed and also has a command area here, which might come into play as you go through battle. Plus, it talks about how the exploding of the tomatoes work, how fermenting works, and also how you can use sneak tokens, which we're going to see as we're going to get one here at the very end. And we're able to go ahead and try and inspect some of these tomatoes to determine which ones are the ones that are unstable or not. Now I can tell you right now, just for doing that one damage I did to the tomato I just did when I flipped it over, it was not one of the unstable ones. But now you can see here, there's no armor on these tomatoes, but other enemies you may face in the game later on will have armor and can also have shields as well. 
So let's say hypothetically we hit a tomato for three damage and it had four health, but it also had a shield on it. Now that's much like all the tomatoes that are out there from the very beginning of this combat. Well, let's say that the armor rating here for these tomatoes was at a one. If I'm hitting it for two damage, one of the damage will be absorbed by the shield first, which is a token that gets removed. And then the one armor that the tomato may have had would remove the second point point of damage so at the end of the day nothing would have gotten through now these are just tomatoes they don't have armor on them but you can be sure that you're going to find enemies in the future that will have armor and of course the armor doesn't get removed only the shields do so the start of initiative phase ability on my thug is now complete. So half the card, the activation card is complete and the other half will trigger at the end of the hero phase in the future. But looking at other initiative abilities I could trigger right now, I have cheap shot here, which I could spend this die, which I think I'm going to do. And you may be able to start an encounter in a group with a minion. And I'm gonna do that. So I'm gonna have my Viking go into a group with a bunch of minions. And then he's going to go ahead and attack dealing two damage to an adjacent character and I get to add an exposure marker after the attack to that character and of course this has to be done during the initiative phase which we are currently in now let's talk about movement because the thug was able to do his attack from range here whereas the viking is going to be getting up close and personal with a group so how does movement work in this game well as you can plainly see there's no grid anywhere so this isn't like a typical game in the sense of a battle where we have grid and we have to deal with orthogonal diagonal movement counting movement being certain spaces away all that kind of stuff is thrown out the window and it's more streamlined here you're as a character going to be moving between groups in order to become adjacent or distant to each other or to terrain and pets we don't have any pets here though and when a character moves it either moves to join an existing group or it splits off to create a new group consisting of only themselves so my Viking being very unhonorable is going to go into this group and is going to make a cheap shot on one of the minions. I'm going to hit the one that, that doesn't have any shield. So it goes straight through to its health and it's going to be two damage. There's no way I can boost this, but that's really going to rock this thing. So that worked out really nicely. So basically the top chip was completely removed. The bottom chip was then flipped over to its yellow side, meaning that this one only has one HP left to be taken out. Now, one thing I forgot to give myself at the very end of resolving the start of initiative phase right here, which I just caught, is gaining that stealth token. I knew I was going to get one, but I forgot to actually give it to myself. So now I have that stealth token. So it might be worth explaining what we can use the stealth token for in this particular fight. So looking at the top left hand corner of the battle sheet, you'll see here in the initiative phase, I can use a stealth token to inspect the markers of a tomato, even if at full HP. So I'm going to go ahead and use that stealth token in order to check out one of the tomatoes. And I wanna check out the tomato that is at full health right next to my Viking. So now we're gonna find out if the full health with the shield tomato is an unstable one or not. It's also worth mentioning I've placed an exposure token on the tomato that I cheap shotted earlier. So here we go. We're gonna remove this shield, not permanently, just so we can take a peek underneath using that stealth token I burned. And it is an unstable tomato. Interesting. So now we have to think about strategy on this one because it is a good thing. And I can show you guys in a second on the battle sheet how this exploding tomato could be used to our advantage, but it also can be bad because, well, it's not just gonna hurt the enemies, it'll also hurt us as well. So you'll see on this sheet, the battle sheet, it says if an unstable tomato becomes defeated, it explodes and you resolve the explode effects below. When a tomato explodes, it deals one damage to each adjacent character and to each not engaged hero. So a hero not adjacent to an enemy. So taking a look at the game board here, here you'll see somebody like the thug off here in the distance all by itself would still be impacted by an exploding tomato as it is not engaged at all. So we'd want to get it into the action. We'd want to get it up against the tree potentially so that we could maybe draw the other groups of minions over there eventually to make a larger group so that when one of the tomatoes explodes, it impacts many more enemies than just one or two. So let's go ahead and aim to try and bring them to us. 
The other initiative ability I could use if I wish to is the tree. And you'll see here it states on at the top, you may move to this terrain, but it's unusable if you're surrounded. So what is surrounded? Well, my Viking is currently surrounded because there is two times as many enemies to heroes in this group. So my Viking is currently landlocked essentially, and I'm unable to use any maneuver, which I actually do have on a card here at this time. However, if I chose to have the thug make use of the tree which i can do the thug could come to the tree and this would equal things out my viking would no longer be surrounded and would be free to be able to use its maneuver to go elsewhere and maybe use the lasers that are on it but before I get too far ahead of myself, let's go ahead and have the thug move up here. And on the tree, it also says that you're going to throw some acorns. You're gonna use only if adjacent to this terrain, which I will be, and it's gonna be dealing two exposure to a character of my choice. So I would place that likely on this one right here. And just like that, we're all squared away. The initiative phase is now done. The enemy phase. And in this phase, each hero will activate a certain number of enemy minions, prioritizing the ones that have not yet been activated this round. The default number for activations is two per hero. So we'll have two for each of uh, the thug and the Viking, and we'll be doing the one at a time. Every time we activate a minion, we'll place a cube on it to let us know that we've activated so we don't accidentally do it a second time. And of course, we use an activation card to determine what that minion is going to do. Which hero is going to activate things first is just going to be determined on the threat level, which is in the top right hand corner corner of each of the cards. You'll see a 7 on the Thug and a 43 on the Viking, so the Thug is activating things first. I'm going to go ahead and choose for the Thug to have this minion right here activate. We'll draw an activation card and we have a 2. Two on this battle sheet states engage. If not engaged, move to, and that green icon stands for the active hero, which in this case is the thug. So things are gonna be pretty busy over here at this group on the far side. So this minion right here moved from over here, which is the activating minion. And because it's the one we're currently activating, I'll go ahead and place a black cube on it. It's also worth mentioning when I went ahead and used the tree, right after I was done using it, I was supposed to flip it over to its opposite side as this is gonna remind us to trigger it later on at the end of round for the enemies and uh, at this point we're also going to go through the bottom portion of the two activation card which states bite so now this minion has moved here to the thug it's going to bite a dealing one damage to the active player and that currently is the thug so one damage to the thug will knock it from six down to five i'll visually show you the bottom half of that card so it's dealing one damage to the adjacent active player is the green icon and if the active player is not an option, then it would move to the individual with the highest threat. At this point, the thug is going to activate a second minion. So we'll grab an activation card for this one. And it is a queen this time. The queen card states here, frantic bounces. If not engaged, and just so you understand what engaged means, essentially you have to have a hero and an enemy in a group together. They are considered engaged. But the one we chose to activate was all by itself. So it's not engaged. So it's going to move to the lowest... Uh, threat level individual which is going to be the thug and then unfortunately it's going to deal one damage to the adjacent lowest threat character which is the thug so one more hit and then put an exposure marker on the thug too so this is currently how the thug looks there's an exposure marker on him now and down to four health and that group over there on the right is getting busier and busier, but this might work to our advantage for these exploding tomatoes. Now moving to the Viking to activate two of the minions. I've chosen the one on the far left there of the group of two, grabbing an activation card. We also got a two. And that tomato does one damage to the Viking, dropping him from six to five. So as you can see, this enemy phase gets pretty aggressive quite quickly. We still have one more minion we need to choose to activate. I'm gonna go ahead and activate this one right here. We'll draw a card to see what happens. It is the ace. The ace here says it's gonna bounce away. So if this minion was engaged, it's gonna to move to an empty group by itself, but it is not engaged. It's already in an empty group by itself. So we'll skip past that. It then says splash, deal one exposure to each hero. So each hero is gonna get an exposure placed on them, which is not good. And then spit, deal one damage to the active uh, player, which is currently, or character, which is currently the Viking. So another 
another damage going to him. And of course, because he's being hit, the exposure marker that's placed on him is going to be revealed. So we're definitely losing one damage off the top, and we're going to find out right now if this exposure marker does anything else to us. This one is a shuffle, which says turn all the face-up exposure markers face down and shuffle them in with the rest of the face-down exposure markers. This is actually a really good time to get this because the only one that I actually have is the one that's face-up right now. So literally, I'll just be taking this token and shuffling it back into the pile of face-down exposure markers. It didn't add any extra damage to the equation, but both of our characters are now down to four health each. And now we move into the hero phase, and this is where I can go ahead and use dice off the cards that are still remaining in order to trigger abilities, usually the most powerful ones for my heroes. So I'm going to try to strategically do this to do the most damage to all these tomatoes that have gotten very, very intertwined into this one group. So my plan of attack here is to boost up my heroism like crazy in order to make my lasers attack really powerful. You'll see at the very bottom there, I can spend a heroism in order to boost the damage by one to each target. So if I really want to take that attack the next level I want to put in as much heroism as I can and there's no limit to it as long as I have them and if I don't use heroism in the current round at the very end they all go away anyway including shields and a number of other things that get reset at the end of a round so let's boost it up as much as we can and do a massive attack and hopefully any type of explosions from tomatoes imploding that are unstable will cause even more ripple effects and damage so we're going to go ahead right now and actually I might even use the black hole potion to suck more into to the fray here so we'll talk about that in a second too this could be really fun so what we're going to do is take the forbidden tome i'm going to use this first to gain one heroism token and then deal myself one of the exposure markers which are face down so i'm going to grab one right now and we are going to literally resolve it as it states immediately i got myself an act or i should say a round two plus one damage so if this had been the second round of combat this would have added a damage in against me and it would have added to the attack coming against me so as of right now it's not going to hurt me because i'm in round number one so i've already escaped there which is good what I gain right now is a heroism token, which I'll place here, and of course matching on the other side with a thug. So I've got two at my disposal, which is pretty awesome. So what I'm going to do now is instead of moving, I'm going to gain a heroism right off the maneuver card. So that is another one coming my way for a total of three, which is really awesome. This is going to be such a crazy powerful attack. I absolutely love this when these things work out. So you can see here the lasers. It says attack deal two damage to a character if the target had exposure. So I'm going to choose somebody on purpose that has exposure and it's going to work out really well because there is one of these tomatoes that has two exposure on them and it's full up to five health. I need to get through one armor and four health to take it out. And it's the one that we looked at and used our stealth token to check to see if it was an unstable tomato and it was so that's the one i'm going to pinpoint and because it has exposure markers on it as it states here you must deal two damage to another character in the same group as the target if possible which is ending up being another five damage actually thanks to my heroism tokens so i can hit another one of the big full up health individuals and wipe them out this is going to be pretty nuts now, in order to get the best bang for buck from this exploding tomato, I'm going to go ahead before I do this laser's attack and use an item. It's a consume item here, and it says target each character in two groups. So I'm going to choose this one here all by itself and this one over here by itself and move all the targeted characters into an empty group. So we're literally just going to have all of these individuals smash into the middle together. Now, for all intents and purposes, at this point, we are all part of the same group and we are definitely surrounded. So going forward until we can get these numbers under control, our two characters aren't really going anywhere. But we're going to now do that lasers attack that I talked about moments ago, dealing five damage. And I'm choosing the one that has five damage to take plus some exposure markers so I can do an additional attack of five damage too. Now this is pretty wild. So first off, that individual is definitely killed off. The two exposure markers that flipped up, one would give additional damage if it was round two, but it's not, so it doesn't matter. This says it's going to push things, but what's important to note around the push is it's not gonna happen until the entirety of the attack itself is done. So I still get to complete the entirety of the attack from the die that I removed, meaning that this entire individual here is completely 
completely wiped off of the board. My Viking will get pushed, but it still gets to do its five damage attack before that push occurs. It's gonna push the Viking out into its own empty group afterwards. I'm just gonna go ahead and choose to pick another one of these, but we have to also remember the one that I hit caused one damage as it exploded to everybody here. So there's a bunch of stuff I need to resolve. And the first thing we're gonna have to do is flip over this in order to determine what happens with this individual and knock off a whole bunch of shields elsewhere, plus take two damage for both of my heroes. So just like that, off screen, heroes are down to three health apiece. This individual is here that has the exposure marker flip over, said it would do additional damage for round three. Not gonna matter anyway, this thing is gone. So we're now just down, and of course you also notice all the shields off the other ones have all been removed because of that damage from that particular tomato exploding. But now we get to place our five damage attack. And if I get lucky enough, before I get pushed away, I might be able to trigger another explosion, but I have no idea which power to pick so i'm going to do this right now while you guys are watching here to see how this pans out so we'll choose this one here we're going to hit it and no that is not the one but it will wipe it out it's not going to cause any ripple effects in terms of damage but it will definitely blow it away and at this point the viking is now being pushed off into its own group which is kind of inconvenient now something else that's inconvenient is when the damage from the exploding tomato hit the thug, it also triggers the flipping of any exposure markers on my characters, and unfortunately the thug has two. So we're going to flip these over and see what else happens. Good, that doesn't apply right now. And that is a push. So both of my heroes are being pushed away from the current group. So this is currently how things look as of right now, and I still have, if you remember, one more potential attack with my lasers that I was hoping to do to something, but now I have no ability to move anymore. That push really messed me over and I'm not gonna be able to make use of that extra die on the lasers anymore. But I still was able to accomplish a lot and we likely are gonna be able to finish these things off in the second round. We now come to the end of round phase, which is the final phase of a round. We're gonna remove all heroism tokens, although we used every single one we had, any shield tokens are now gone, stealth tokens are gone, any increase to threat markers are gone, and it's also worth noting all of the uh, cubes on each of the activated minions can now be taken off as well. Now you'll remember before when I was talking about the tree and the fact that we actually used it, and because we used it we flipped the token over on the battle mat, when this particular token is sitting here and there is no dice on this card when it comes to the end of round phase, this is what is going to trigger the enemy's usage of the tree at this point, being that they get to take advantage of it just like we did. And it stays down here at the very bottom, move to this terrain and draw an activation card. So we pick one minion and we do exactly that. So in this case, all the minions are exactly the same. We don't have any information as to which ones are unstable underneath. We have three of them and they're all at full health. So let's go ahead and flip a card over and we'll just activate one of them. I got myself a two. So it says, if not engaged, move to the active player. Now in this particular case, the active player is likely going to be the individual with the highest threat when we are currently not having anyone activate. We're at an end of round state. so need Either one of these characters are currently active, but the one that has the most threat, that presents the most threat, is the Viking. So that's where this individual is going, and it's going to deal one damage to the Viking. So the Viking is now down to two health, the Thug has three health, the tree terrain token has been flipped back over for usage if the heroes wish to do it again. You can see that there is going to be a little bit of pain coming our way if we do that in the future. And this is a tighter battle than I might have expected. Heading into the second round, we're gonna speed things up because there's no need for explanations going forward. We're just gonna move through and see whether we can pull off a win in this battle by taking out these tomatoes. So in the roll phase right now, we're gonna go ahead, flip over the card for the goon. The new activation card for the thug states end of initiative phase and start of hero phase as the timing as to when these two abilities could potentially happen. It's worth mentioning in the prior round, the end of hero phase based on on where people were situated on the battle mat, I was unable to do this big time attack, which would have been quite awesome if I had been adjacent to the hero. But with all the pushing that occurred, well, I wasn't in the right position, so we skipped past it. 
Let's go ahead and do our first dice roll of the round to see how we do out of the gates. We got ourselves a five, a six, a skull here, skull there, another five, and a three. Not bad. I slotted in a maneuver, an uppercut, and two over there on the lasers. Let's re-roll for the first time two dice from this initial roll. We got ourselves a six and a shield. I'm going to keep on searching. I don't like that. I wanna, I wanna, I'm looking for specific... Oh, there we go. That worked out well. A three, which will place on maneuver, giving me the ability to move around a little bit or gain some heroism tokens. And this five I'll place right here on the cheap shot. Now, I don't have to worry about the start around effect that's happening right now in the start around phase because I do have a die slotted there, so no exposure marker for the Viking. However, I am going to go ahead and use the die on this in the initiative phase, which it is right now, thanks to the lightning bolt right here on this trait card ability. And it says to attack to deal two damage to an adjacent character and one exposure after the attack. And we're doing that right now. So two damage with no shields and no armor. It's going to go straight through removing a full chip and there is nothing underneath of it. Not an stable tomato here we know there's another one out there but it's not that one now my thug does have an initiative ability for maneuver but i don't want to move him any closer right now because remember initiative phase happens right before the enemy phase i'm not going to try to purposely put my thug right into the mix of a bunch of enemies i'll hope that whatever we draw doesn't have my thug get hit anymore but of the two that i'm controlling right now the thug actually has more health at three versus two in the enemy phase, we're going to activate some minions, two for each, but you'll see there's only three left. So thankfully, only three are going to be activated in total. So the Viking is the highest threat. So the Viking is activating minions of his choice. So I'm going to go ahead and choose to activate the one right in front. So we'll go ahead and put a black cube on it. We're going to draw a card from the activation deck. We have a Joker. The Joker here states, enthusiastic bounces. If not engaged, move to the highest threat. Well, we're already engaged right now with it, so nothing there. Red Wave, deal two exposure to each of adjacent hero. That's not good. So I'll be taking two exposure and placing them face down on my Viking. And then it says high pressure. If I have two HP or less, I explode. Well, that's going to happen because, well, it's down to two HP. And we're going to resolve that explode, which we know is going to throw a damage at our Viking. Now, we also know that not only the adjacent individuals to the tomato that explodes get a damage, but also any uh, not engaged hero in play. And currently, our thug is off by itself. So splatter damage is going to occur here. So the thug will actually be taking a point of damage and the Viking. What's even nastier is I just accumulated two two exposure markers on the Vikings, so we're flipping those over as well. And the only positive is that tomato has been completely destroyed. Well, this is getting a tad stressful. We're gonna go ahead and flip over these exposure markers and see what else happens. Okay, oh, round two and additional damage. That's gonna do it. That's gonna knock my Viking out. Oh, so the third one doesn't hit. So that's an additional plus one to the one that was just given. So two damage is coming off my Viking who's been taken out. So unfortunately, our Viking has been taken down, so the marker is going to come off the mat. We still have the Thug, who could push through for a victory, and if I'm able to do that, I'm going to be able to bring back the Viking to one health. It's a good thing I loaded up my Thug with some dice so he can actually be productive. He does take that splash damage of one HP, so that's going to hit him. He's down to two. This is not looking good. I've got a really bad feeling about this, and we are going to activate the next enemy based on moving to the Thug now, because the Viking's at to play so we're going to choose to activate doesn't really matter we'll choose this one right here we're drawing a card from the activation deck it's worth mentioning when the activation deck has been run through fully you just go ahead and build another activation deck by taking those cards flipping them over and shuffling them together so here we go off the top is a two a two is going to have this individual engage us and then it's going to bite us for one damage we're down to a single HP. And now we're going to activate the final tomato and we draw the Joker. Oh no. So if not engaged, move to the highest threat. So it will be moving right up against the thug. It's going to deal two exposure to my thug. And then if this thing has two HP or less, it's going to explode. The good news is it will not explode. So that's a plus. Yeah, I think I'm in some serious trouble with just one HP and two exposure markers on my thug. I don't see myself pulling this off but i do have the ability to make some attacks here we'll see what we can do so with the thug being the only character in play or hero that i can control right now looking at the very top it states end of initiative phase you might have thought that i skipped over this well i did on purpose because if you can't do it based on the text you don't get that advantage so it says here to move to an enemy that is the only one in its group and at the end of the initiative phase there was not a single tomato all by itself so i wasn't able to pull that off which is unfortunate but start of the hero phase is right now so 
I do get to take advantage of this, and it's worth mentioning, with the Thug, I'm able to actually activate an ability at the same time in order to boost this thing up. So this allows me to do an attack, dealing three damage to an adjacent enemy, and I can boost it up by one by burning a stealth token or heroism token, and I can gain a heroism, actually, sorry, a stealth token, by just spending this die. So we're going to go ahead and get one of those tokens, and then we're going to instantly go ahead and use it, which is going to boost the attack up to four. I have no idea which of these two tomatoes is unstable, but I know one of them is, and I'm really hoping that I land the right one, but I have literally no clue. And of course, I could have used the stealth token in order to figure that out, but then I wouldn't be able to boost it to a point where I could wipe out one of the tomatoes completely. So that's my focus right now. So here we go, swinging for the fences. We're going to take the one closest to us and see whether we hit the jackpot or not. We did! Awesome! So we are going to be able to not only take out the... Ex oh, oh wait, this is bad. The excitement is draining from me as I realize that hitting that also hits me. So at the same time as I kill off that tomato, it does damage of one to the other tomato, but then the one damage comes through to the thug. I only have one health and I have two exposure tokens, and if I flip those exposure tokens, or I should say exposure tokens over, well, things even got more aggressive. It'll actually be two damage because we're not in round one of battle anymore. One plus the one from the explosion is two. The thug has been taken out and we were literally down to essentially this for the end of the battle. It came down to the wire. Now, taking a look at what I've got here in front of me, I'm trying to calculate whether it was even possible for me within this round to win this. Let's say, hypothetically, I'd hit the tomato that wasn't going to explode. So I would have done a clean kill, and then would have had this uppercut here that allows me to deal three damage to an adjacent character, and if this is a combo, move the target uh, to a distant group. But that wouldn't really help me, and I would have nothing else heroism-wise in order to boost the attack. So really, the tomato would be down to just one HP holding on for dear life. It's possible going into the next round based on initiatives and of course if I went into the next round of combat I would actually be able to I'd be rolling much less dice as my viking has been taken out but I'd be able to roll this uh, green die here and a red die hoping to land enough to maybe trigger something but as you can see from the abilities here I don't really have much going for me I'd have to hope that I maybe pulled something from the um, activation deck or something like that timing wise to help me it, it, long story short, it would have been very, very close. Now, this is exactly the type of combat you can expect to have inside of Assault on Doomrock. It is going to throw all kinds of stuff at you. You'll become very familiar with your thug for the AI as well as your Viking or whichever character you're choosing to control. But the actual variability of the different enemies you're going up against, plus how the activation deck pans out in terms of what it's going to tell you to do, plus what's going on in terms of on the battle mat itself for positioning, activation of minions, and of course bosses can be a part of that as well. There's a lot here, and I really like, the thing I like the most about the combat system in this game is the fact that movement has been streamlined to something that just makes a lot of sense. You're not going to be bogged down by having to deal with, well, how do I I move to position myself to be able to pull off an attack. It's very straightforward and you're also very easily able to identify when you're pinned down and surrounded and you aren't able to take advantage of movement or maneuvering around the battle mat. And things like that just help to streamline the combat so you're focusing on the attacking and the thinning down of the minions versus the logistics of positioning. So overall my campaign ended in a failure but I had a lot of fun playing through this. And of course if you're successful and you don't get taken out and as long as one of your heroes is still standing, you get to go to the next act. And from there, you will do the same thing you saw earlier in the video, going through an adventure and then a battle, and then to the third act for an adventure and a battle and the focus on Doom Rock. So I wasn't able to, of course, do all of that within one video, and I was also unable to even successfully get out of the first act on video. But I really hope that this helps you make an informed decision on the game. The Assault on Doom Rock game has been around for some time now, but this now coming as the ultimate edition looks to enhance what is very much a beloved game in the solo gaming community and hopefully make it that much better for newcomers and experienced players that have been around for a long time. Let me know in the comments below what you thought about this one. Thank you guys so much for joining me and watching this video. And as always, keep on rolling solo.